Okay, good evening. I was wondering who would remember that we're meeting again tonight, and you guys did, and I'm very grateful for that. And for anyone who's watching online, I'm grateful you're here also, as we take on an incredible challenge. What is that incredible challenge? We are going to study one entire book of the Bible in just one night. I mean, how could we even think that we could do that? when the book is Second John, which is one chapter, and not even a particularly long chapter, you know, as we look at it. But um, we are going to have that uh, privilege tonight. And before we uh, go any further, let's open our time in prayer, shall we? Uh, Father, I am just so grateful that uh, you gave us life and you give us hope. In dark times, you give us reason to press on and to believe that you are working all good things according to your pleasure. Father, we know our world is in a turbulent place, politically, racially, um, and obviously with COVID-19, with uh, health in question in so many areas. But Father, we also know that you in your mercy are taking good care to move things along according to your perfect will, a will that we do not fully understand or grasp but we trust you with. So in the end, we're looking forward to great things from a great God as we move forward. So tonight, bless our study of the book of Second John, so that in the end, your son Jesus, our Lord, will be glorified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, once again, it's uh, great to be uh, back with you, and uh, I did enjoy the break. I went on a trip, and coming back and not teaching immediately when you come back is a nice thing. Um, and so I uh, did enjoy that break. Um, how do you guys weather the storm? No TV, no internet. Yeah, lots of fun. I did not lose anything. I felt, so, I was like, what's the big deal? You know? <laughs> but um, I was on a Zoom call when the storm was blowing through. And I'm in front of a window, you know, like sitting in front of a window like this. I'm watching the trees go like this. And I don't have a big piece of land. I, I live in a parsonage in Manhasset, but it has one massive tree. And I was like, Lord, that's the one tree I do not want to fall. And it, it didn't, it survived again. And I was very uh, grateful. On the other hand, although my mother lives with me, her house is abandoned or empty and has, it's an acre of land and lots of trees. And she lost three of them at uh, her house. So um, it's just that nobody's living there, so we didn't feel the pain of losing those uh, trees. And uh, you know we can wait for whenever the people come to, to cut the wood. But it was a dramatic couple hours. My biggest annoyance, though, was in the morning, I have a Kia, and at 9.30, I dropped my Kia off at East Meadow Kia dealership. And I'm like waiting for the, you know, what's wrong with the car? What's wrong with the car? Never call came. Then no call on Wednesday. I call them, no answer. Same with Thursday. Same with Friday. I called California Kia National Headquarters. I said, can you get through to my Kia dealership? Their power came back Saturday morning. And so I still do not have my car. Um, and I've been using my uh, daughter's car to get by. So. As much as I've scathed, you know, scathing free from my house, not from my car. <laughs> and so I think tomorrow I'm looking forward to getting my car back once again. All right, that's enough rabbit trail stuff and uh, we'll, we'll dig in. So tonight we're going to look at the book of uh, Second John. And we believe, just like we argued in uh, the presentation of First John, that this book technically is anonymous. You do not hear the name John mentioned at all in the book, but by both church history and stylistically, it does smell like John. It has the exact same feel, um, and it particularly connects with first and third John. You get the same kind of issues that are being discussed as to uh, you know, what's happening and, and what's taking place. And so that gives us uh, an understanding of a context. So help me here. What books did John write that we know of? 
the gospel. Revelation. Revelation. And then 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So he wrote a good chunk of the New Testament. Who wrote the most in the New Testament? Anyone know the answer to that? No. Everyone jumps to Paul, but it is Luke. Luke has 24 chapters in uh, the gospel, and he has 28 chapters in the book of Acts. Now, Paul, he wrote a lot of books, and he is second in terms of the amount of writing. John would be third uh, in terms of how much actual writing is there. But it, that always catches people by surprise. It's got to be Paul. It's just like if you ask somebody, like, what are we studying on Sunday morning? Does anyone know? I hope somebody knows. Hebrews, yes. <laughs> Hebrews. And if I ask you who wrote Hebrews, the average person will say, if they're a church-going person, will say, Paul. But we actually have no evidence. But the reason why uh, Hebrews shows up after the Pauline epistles is because a lot of people in the ancient church thought perhaps he wrote it, and so they put it after all of Paul's letters. But in reality, we don't know. And uh, I don't think Paul wrote it for a couple reasons. Um, primarily, when you read it, it reads so different than Paul's style of argumentation. When I was in seminary, I had a professor who liked to mess with the students now and then. And by the way, that's, that's a good professor. You know, it's kind of prick you, make you think a little different. And uh, he was reading from the book of Hebrews, and then he says this, what Priscilla is trying to say here, and just responding to see if anyone like uh, commented, believe it or not, there isn't a pretty old tradition that says Priscilla may have written it, but that because it was a woman, the name was left off. We don't know that, you know, it, but... As I said, my professor was just trying to be a little provocative, get the discussion going a little bit. Um, yes? Is that Priscilla with Aquila? Aquila and Priscilla. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, they are important because in the ancient world, and let's admit it, this is another rabbit trail, but we have a little book tonight. We can take a few rabbit trails. Priscilla and Aquila are credited with teaching who the word more carefully. Apollos, excellent. Now, here's what we know in the ancient world. When two names are mentioned, usually the first name is the primary name. For example, T Philippians is written by two people. Did you know that? Well, it's written by Paul and Timothy. But do we really think Timothy had a big part of writing Philippians? Not really. I mean, it, it sounds so much like Paul, and he says, you know, of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day. I mean, he's giving all this personal testimony, but he credits two names. Now, this is interesting because whenever we see Priscilla and Aquila, the woman's name is mentioned first. So the evidence of history is that it was Priscilla who was pretty sharp with the word and corrected Apollos, not Aquila, her husband. Um, again, it's not, we know this categorically true, but Priscilla seems to be a pretty sharp woman. And I'll tell you this, when I do a little polling about the women in our church, if I was to go around with a microphone and ask Bible questions, I would put money that the women would give me better answers than the men on average. I hate to say that, guys. We got to get our act together. But that is the reality. And on a given Sunday morning, what's the percentage between women and men? It's about 60% women and 40% men. And anyone who's single and looking for a good Christian guy can swear that this is a problem, <laughs> you know, that you're, that you're dealing with. But um, that is uh, the case. And it actually is relevant, believe it or not, to what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, as we uh, read this letter. So without further ado, let's look at John, the second book of John, um, and I'll read our one chapter. It reads this way. The elder, to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, 
because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth. Just as the Father commanded us, and now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is a deceiver and the Antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your sister, who is chosen by God, send their greetings. All right, this is a, a fun little book, potent. And when you get that little verse at the end, I want to end the letter now, but I want to talk to you face to face because I got so much to tell you. Don't you wish we had that? It's like, Paul, oh, excuse me, John, write it down. We want to read that too. What do you have to tell them? Apparently, there was nothing in that conversation that the Holy Spirit felt that the church down through the ages was going to need. And so we don't have that. Um, this past week, I did something for fun. I went into a crate in our basement that I have not opened for 15, 20 years. And what it contains is letters that I wrote to Michelle when we were dating I also have some letters from girlfriends I dated besides Michelle. No, she did not ask me to burn them, and I didn't ask her to burn hers. <laughs> but it has all this old stuff in it. And so I came across a number of letters that I just kind of picked it up and read. So here's one from my brother's girlfriend, a woman named Vicki, who we eventually married. In fact, they were married 40 years this September. So she wrote this approximately 41 years ago. She says, hi, my name is Vicki. Based on what your brother describes you, it sounds like you're a pretty neat guy. We've never met. I live in California. And as you know, my, uh, my boyfriend, your brother, lives in New York. I want to give him a surprise birthday present. I'm sending it to you. Could you please set it up and, you know, make it all set and, you know, all this. Why I even kept this letter, I don't even know. You know, it's just a a letter from a woman he ultimately married, but I kept it. So I took a picture of it and I sent it to her. And I said, what did you give him? Because I don't have any memory. To which she said, I have no memory either. <laughs> and to which she asked my brother, do you have a memory? And he's like, I have no memory you gave me, you know, kind of thing. And she got a kick out of the fact that she called me neat. I'm really neat, neato, you know, isn't that nice? But that is kind of what John's doing. We're getting a piece of something and it causes us to look at this letter kind of like investigators to see what's happening. Now, I want to go to the next question that shows up right in verse 1. First of all, we have the author. And what's the author's name in this? Verse 1. The elder. Okay, does that tell us much? No, it does not tell us much at all. If we know, based on what we know, John, in writing this, certainly would be considered an elder because he would, my mom's 90, he would probably be older than my mom. 
And, and I tell you, uh, uh, I, I watch certain people, like a, a famous uh, President Ford and H.W. Bush National Security Advisor died this week. John Stonecroft was his name, 95 years old. Um, it wasn't too long that Charles uh, uh, Schultz, who was, I'm trying to remember his first name, is it Charles Schultz? Anyway, Schultz was um, President Reagan's Secretary of State. He's still alive, I think 98. And he's still writing editorials, still engaged. He, the, the, John is like those guys. Sharp as a tack and still pretty old. And, and I tell you, if you know anyone in your life who fits this category, don't miss the opportunity to know them. When, when I was at Trinity, one of these professors, a guy named Gleason Archer, he wrote a book that's still in, lots of books that are still in print. One of them is Bible Difficulties. Another one is Old Testament Survey. Anyway, when I went to seminary, this guy had retired years before but you know what? He still popped in to teach a class occasionally. And I sat in his class because I wanted to say I studied under Gleason Archer. But the guy was in his mid-80s, you know, and it was like, I thought it was so cool to be able to do this. So when John calls himself the elder, there is definitely a connotation of age here. But most scholars will agree the sense is not so much age as it is authority. You've heard the phrase, listen to your elders. Well, that is what's going on here. So John is primarily speaking, we think, in position of authority, as well as being one of the older people. Um, some church denominations, by the way, take elder to be, it has to be an old person. Um, we have, if you notice, in the Shelter Rock Church, we have a large Indian community. Many of them come from the Plymouth Brethren background. And so we see some of these uh, individuals that really show their mettle. In other words, you see they're, they're, they love the Lord, they know the word, and so we'll approach them at age 38 to consider being an elder. Inevitably, you know what I always get? Oh, I'm too young. Elders are supposed to be old because in the Plymouth Brethren community, they take that phrase completely literally that all the elders of the church are the oldest people in the church. And we have to like twist their arm to say, come on, you can do this. You know, you know we, we think elder does not just mean age. Uh, and by the way, at the time of Jesus, many people died at age 40. So, you know, at age 40, you are in that elder category. But in, in any case, that's where it starts. But now comes our mystery. And the mystery, I want you to think right now in the world, what country, I'll say this, one of the biggest countries in the world, is very difficult to have a church? China, say it again. Russia, China, China. That's what I'm looking for. China has been cracking down on churches more and more over the last few years. Um, they've been eliminating crosses, you know, from churches. The word just came out today. This was in the Christian, not today, but this week from Christian Post magazine that churches, the national church, meaning the ones that have official government approval, which are the ones that really technically only exist, those churches have been told they must speak favorably of the president or uh, premier, whatever you call the guy, um, of, of China or be closed down. That's a strong word. You know, you have to say these things or else we will shut you down. So what is also all over China? A house church movement where people are meeting, but not officially. And estimates are that China has um, many, many Christians it is argued that by um, 2030, China will be the largest, uh, have more Christians than any other nation in the world. That's an unbelievable statement. But if you're gonna meet, and if you're not gonna meet under the thumb of the government, what do you gotta do? Be a little stealthy. 
And so, here's what we read. The elder. To the lady chosen by God and her children whom I love in the truth. One of the arguments as to why he's introducing himself this way is because the lady is a church and the children are the parishioners because it's a time of persecution and they're trying to stay under the radar. We don't know this unequivocally, but it is possible. Now, I want to draw a few other things that have come down to us by church history. First is this. There is an argument that the woman has, it's an actual woman, and that her name is Electa. Now, why I'm showing you some Greek here is because that's what you see in the Greek letters up top. The next series of letters are just its place of speech in the Greek language. And the meaning is the next, unto the elect, or literally it just means elect. And then on the bottom is a transliteration. And so some people think that her name is chosen. Or they say, you would say, Electa. Hello, Electa, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Um, Pastor Jerry's wife is Alexis. You know, it's not that far away. Anyway, some argue that this was an actual person, her name being Electa. Others say, no, 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 you missed the name entirely. It's the next word. Or a woman named Kira. And that comes from the word that comes next. The, the lady uh, chosen uh, by God. And this one is, uh, you see, again, you see the Greek letters up top and then uh, moving uh, forward. And then finally, so in other words, lady is Kira, just to give you the sense. So I'm writing to Kira, don't call her lady, call her Kira, who is chosen. And then there's a group who argue it's both of those. Her name was Kira Electa. Now, everything I just said to you is argued by someone somewhere in both history and in modern scholarship. But the overwhelming view of modern scholarship was that it is another way of saying church to the chosen lady because we don't have much evidence to the contrary. But I'm giving you more than you ever wanted to know. There's a group of scholars who believe he's writing to Mary, as in the mother of Jesus. And there's a group of scholars who believe he's writing to Martha, whose name means lady. But once again, if I was to tell you where does scholarship mostly rest, it mostly rests that it's another way of speaking to the church and then with the argument of being kind of stealth because when John is writing is a high time of persecution. And so just using language that if you took it literally would be understood, oh, he must be just writing to a, a woman friend of some sort. But we're pretty convinced he's writing to a church just the way the whole letter unfolds. Now, what is important to John in looking at this? I want to draw your attention to the first paragraph. Here's what it says. The elder to the lady chosen by God and her children, whom I love in the truth. Then look at the next line, but also all who know the truth because of the truth which lives in us. Moving forward, uh, that we will be, it will be in us in truth and love. And then finally, I'm glad to see you walking in the truth. Veritas, as the Latin would put it. Do you get the impression in this little tiny letter that truth is important? It is. It, it's very important. We live in a generation which truth is often viewed as relative. And one of the things that is so common now is uh, everyone questioning each other's facts. 
So, uh, you know, watching CNN and they're going to fact check the president's speech or vice versa, Fox News, and they're going to uh, fact check uh, Nancy Pelosi. But it seems to be their own set of facts because you're looking at it and you're like, where are you getting your fact from? You know, I, I'm not sure I can agree with what you're calling a fact. Well, John is making a case that there is such a thing as verifiable truth. And why he's making this case is because there's something out there, which you and I know, called error. There are things out there which are plainly wrong. I shared not too long ago, I think it was with this group, possibly with the Monday night class, that there is a group called the Progressive Christians. Uh, some of them call themselves Red Letter Christians. Others call themselves the, the Emergent Church, although that name has come out of uh, sway. But one of the things, they don't like the Apostle Paul. So they kind of like ignore what Paul wrote and focus only on the words of Jesus. And they feel like that's why they call themselves red letter Christians because the words of Jesus are often in, in red letters. But when you're reading what the progressive Christian community believes, for example, many of them do not believe in the atoning sacrifice of Christ, that his death brought us salvation. They call that divine child abuse. Why would God abuse his own child? You know, they find that despicable, horrible. Well, you can't walk away from the New Testament and not consider Jesus as an atoning sacrifice, even in the Gospels. But Paul develops it the most. Okay, if truth is relative, you know what I can do is lock arms with my progressive Christian brothers and sisters and sing Kumbaya and say, can't we all love each other and get along? And you know what? I am supposed to love them. And I will love my Christians, Christians that believe what I think are deviant forms of belief. But there's going to be a boundary in what truth is. You cannot walk away from the New Testament without a clear discernment that they believe, these New Testament writers, in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's just there, and it's present overtly. Therefore, John is dealing with a cult, some kind of schismatic group of false teachers. And the truth is, there is right teaching, and there is wrong teaching, and you got to know the difference. And so like any parent, you're wanting to explain this to your child. And so John is taking that tone with them. And that's why truth is so important. So he says this, to the chosen lady, which pause there because there's another potent thing, God chose you. Isn't that cool? Anyone who's lived through the, the rigors of going to elementary school or junior high where you have to pick teams and they, they have a captain on each team and you get to be the last person picked, none of us want that position. None of us want that position. But it's good to be chosen. It feels good. I was at a gathering last night, um, somebody's birthday in the church, and there was a man there. I never met him before, but he's a dignitary from Pakistan. And he asked me if I would speak at some major Pakistani event to the Christians in, that are living in New Jersey. And then he said, would you come to Pakistan with me? Now, I have no idea, A, that they'll follow through on this. And number two, I'm not sure I want to go to Pakistan <laughs> because it's one of those areas where there's a lot of unrest towards Christians. That being said, though, I'm not, I didn't say no, and it was kind of nice to be asked. You know, it, it felt good. You know what I told them? Go to shelterrockchurch.com, listen to me speak before you give me a formal invitation. I may not be as good as you think I am. <laughs> you know, I just wanted to convey that. But that idea of being chosen is so significant in the Scripture. One of the best passages 
to speak about you and I being chosen is Ephesians chapter 1, where Paul speaks of our being predestined into the faith. God intended you to be his. And before you go on a rabbit trail here and say, maybe he didn't pick me. If you're a believer, you're picked. It's, it's one of these things that you discover once you already believe. And, and, you, and you realize, wow, he picked me. And I don't know why, but it's a beautiful thing. And by the way, that's one of the things that great gives us confidence before the throne of God, is I was chosen. So he starts that way. To the lady chosen by God and her children, implied they're chosen too, whom I love in the truth. What do you think he means by loving in the truth? Say it again. To love your brothers and sisters in Christ, possibly. I'm going to argue, though, that it's defining that which we share in common in belief. And the reason why is because he's going to get to false teaching. And so he's looking at a community that share something in common. We, we're in this together. Um, and, and you find this. I, I think I gave you an illustration in this class. One of my downsides, by the way, of teaching Zechariah on Monday night and First John, or on, you know, Second John on Sunday night, is I, I, I mix up where I gave an illustration. But I, I gave an illustration that uh, my mother and I were eating out at a restaurant, and this person came and gave this air of having some kind of belief system my mother assumed that the person was a believer. And after the waiter went away, I said to my mom, I'm not sure he is. Something smells a little hinky here. But waiter comes back and I just waited in and asked him, hey, uh, you obviously have a belief system. Uh, what church you go to? Oh, I go to Kingdom Hall, uh, which is Jehovah Witness. And you suddenly go, ah, thank you. I appreciate that. I don't love him in the truth. I might love him. I should love him as a created being in God's image. And I am called to love him, but I'm not loving him in the truth. We don't share the same views of who Jesus is. So that is why I would lean on it's that kind of truth that he's speaking about. Uh, and it says, not only I, but also all who know the truth. So in other words, there is a big community of people who know the truth and we share this in common. And it is a beautiful thing that wherever I go in the world, there are Christians that I can embrace and hug and, and love. Uh, so I was on the Great Wall of China. When you go to China and you're, you know, average American, you gotta go to the Great Wall. You know, you're in Beijing. So we, we go to the Great Wall. Now, I know statistically, because I study, there's a lot of Christians in China. And so I want to meet them. And so I start talking really loud on the Great Wall. I'm looking forward to meeting the missionaries in, in uh, Mongolia. Oh, isn't it going to be wonderful to be with those Christian missionaries? My wife starts hitting me because she knows what I'm trying to do. And... I had close to 10 people make their way to me one at a time and say, I'm here teaching English as a second language. I'm a believer too. And I, it was exactly what I hoped. And then my wife again hit me and said, you stop outing all the missionaries, you know, in, in terms of what's going on. But the amazing thing, and this is truly amazing, I'm on the Great Wall of China meeting brothers and sisters in Christ. Never been there in my life. And I have brothers and sisters in Christ. I go to Mongolia and I am visiting, uh, I think we stopped by seven churches, meeting brothers and sisters in Christ. I am being hugged and embraced by total strangers who are brothers and sisters in Christ. It is such an amazing thing when you realize we're not a little family. We are all over the world. And so he says this, that the truth is what brings us together and not only I, but all of us who know the truth. 
because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. So that is a statement of the assurance of salvation. Have you come to faith in Christ? Have you entered that world of having the truth inside of you? Well, that's a kind of a seal that says you're in this forever. We gotcha. Um, so it's a, it's a beautiful statement of encouragement that I think we all need to, to hear in that hope. And now comes the beginning of his letter. What I mean by the beginning, this is the standard. Uh, let, me, let me say this differently. It is part of the formulaic greeting of a letter. So I'm writing a paper letter to a friend. What's the first thing I write in, in English language? I, I, I would often say the word dear. I might, like when I write to the church, I say dear friends. When I write to Michelle, I go dear, I might go dearest Michelle, because she's my wife, you know, but that's a formulaic way. In our culture, when do you put your name on the letter? At the end. Why do they put their name in the beginning if they're going to put a name? It's a scroll. And so you want to unravel and go, oh, we got the latest letter from Paul here. You want to see it in the beginning. Now, of course, John doesn't do that for us, probably because he's on the island of Patmos and he's in exile and he doesn't put his name. But we hear a, a similar kind of thing, but he's beefed it up. If you were Greek, the way you would start your letter is greetings. And then you would give the name of the person and your name. You know, so it'd all be in the beginning. But he does a little different. He goes, grace, mercy, peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. Now, when you see these three words, Paul would frequently say uh, grace, uh, charis. Charis and uh, uh, the, the Greek equivalent of shalom. So he would combine kind of like a Jewish greeting and a Greek greeting. But John adds this extra word, which is often confused with the word grace, mercy. And so many look at this and they say, mercy is a word that conveys, I need something. I can't save myself. Peace is what I'm craving. And grace is how I get it. In other words, I, I can't get it on my own. At the heart of the gospel is you cannot be a self-saver. Savior, You need someone outside of yourself to save you. And so we have the powerhouse of these three words combined. Grace, mercy, peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us. And now here's a beautiful statement in truth and love. Now, here is the combining of two important principles. And they're both very Johannian. So, Jesus says in John 14, verse 7, I believe it is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, Jesus identifies himself as the truth. That whole interaction of Pilate, what is truth, you know, that's found in John uh, also. But also evident in John and evident in 1 John and in 2 John and 3 John is this love. And so they're to be combined. You know how the Apostle Paul says, I believe it is Ephesians, he says, speak the truth in love. Years ago when I first came to this church, there was a staff member here who said, I know the scripture says, speak the truth in love, but you can keep the truth, give me all the love. Now, I understand that because nobody wants to be corrected. It's not fun, but they have to be combined. Uh, you just got to wade in and recognize if you really want a vibrant, healthy relationship, you need truth and you need love. Yeah, there, were, there were seasons in my marriage with Michelle that we were not getting along great. And 
there were some times I, I felt I should really talk to, uh, to her about this issue, whatever that issue is, but I was a coward. And you know, I kind of wanted to go on pretending we were okay, than just wading in and facing the truth of the matter. But what ultimately brought us healing in the year 2008, in uh, first week of December, if I recall correctly, when we went away to counseling in Colorado, is we dealt with the truth. And ever since we dealt with the truth, I'm 12 years past that now, we have had a better marriage in these last 12 years than we had in all the years preceding. All the years, including right out of the honeymoon and, you know, I am so grateful I've learned the marriage of truth and love is what moves us to success. Other than that, you're living a charade and you're not experiencing, I think, the best that could be there. We, do we settle for that because we're scared. And I, and I would argue justifiably scared because you're afraid, will I lose it all? Will it all fall apart? You know, what will happen? But if you can work through it, fight through it, because you both share something that you want to be successful. In our case, our marriage, we want this to be successful. The end result will be good, but it is the combination of truth and love. So he goes on and we read this. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. Now, when we read that statement, we pick up joy immediately, and he's delighted to meet some of the children who are bringing him this joy. There's two possible interpretations of this. One is that he got some visitors from this church, and that's the sum. In other words, he hasn't seen all the, ch the people from the church. He's seen some of them, and that's a possible translation or interpretation. But the other possible interpretation is he's choosing some because there are schismatics in the church that are not following the way of truth. And the end result is he cannot give an unqualified statement. He has to say some. It's just when you say that, you, you know, you're, you're cautious. <laughs> One of the ways I have... Uh, from time to time when I'm, when I'm earning my wife's anger at me, uh, I'll say to her, you know, let, let's, say, let's say the kitchen is in disarray for a longer period of time. And I say, Michelle, I just want to say the left quadrant of the kitchen counter, I'm, I'm uh, directly to the left of the sugar bowl, but to the right of the flour bowl is immaculate. She looks at me with, well, clean it yourself if you want it clean, you know, something like that. And, and the simple point is when I'm giving a partial compliment, we know that there's another side to it, that there's something not right. So what's the right answer here? I can't honestly tell you, but I can tell you that John Stott, the British commentary that is my primary source for studying this, he argues that he thinks it's very probable he uses the word some because of the schismatics that are in the community that he cannot give an unqualified everyone is hitting on all cylinders in your church. Um, and it's just, you know, the way it is. So he says, give me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth. I want you to notice the word walking because that's going to show up in verse six also when you see the last phrase of verse six, walk in love. This conveys movement. It doesn't convey, and, and here's a, a beautiful way of understanding this. You and I, when we come to faith in Christ, we don't enter into a world of perfection. We're not, but we're walking and we're heading Godward. We fall, we get up, we say, Lord, please forgive me. You move on. You keep walking though. And that is the journey of faith. What's scary and frightening is when people stop walking, when they realize they, they're just not trying anymore and, and they don't care anymore. 
And that's a scary thing when you, when you enter into uh, environments like that. By the way, all over Long Island, I would say that there are churches that stopped walking. How do you can identify churches that stop walking? Nobody's volunteering. Um, you know, they, the only person doing the ministry is the one who's paid up front. And, and you're saying, this is not right. But a healthy church has lots of people walking, participating, doing their thing. As the Father commanded us. Verse 5. And now, dear lady, or dear church, or dear Kira, <laughs> I am not writing you a new command, but one you have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. Now, not a new command. Jesus called it a new command. A new commandment I give you that you love one another. The, the, the way you reconcile these from the Gospel of John to this is that when they came to faith, they received a command. Love one another. He's now writing to an established church in which the instruction remains the same. I'm not giving you something new. This is elementary. Love one another. There was a, a, a preacher at a very large seeker-friendly church, often critiqued for giving shallow messages. And he said, what I've learned over the years is that when people ask for deep messages, they really mean controversial things or obscure things because he says this how are you personally doing on love your neighbor as yourself now the truth is almost everyone arguably everyone has a little space to go on love your neighbor as yourself but if i preach on oh he's preaching pastina you know he's preaching oh so shallow but in reality, that may be exactly what I need. If you want to call a shallow preacher, let's go to John. So here's my text today. Love one another. Probably his congregation all rolls their eyes and go, John, every time you preach at our church, it's the same message. To which he might say, well, from what I see, you still need it. So one of my favorite African-American preachers, uh, E.B. Hill, Young preacher comes into his office and says, Oh, Pastor Hill, Pastor Hill, I'm, I'm stuck. It's Saturday evening and I got nothing to preach tomorrow. I got nothing, nothing, nothing's coming to me. To which E.V. Hill said, Just preach one of your old messages. Oh, Pastor Hill, when I got left seminary, I promised God I would never re-preach one of my old messages. To which Hill said, You know, God is bigger than some of our stupid promises. You see, when you gave your message the first time, 50% of your congregation wasn't there. Of the 50% that were there, 50% don't remember it. Of the 50% that remember it, 50% of them are not applying it. Preach the message over again. And so he did. <laughs> John apparently has no problem preaching the message over again. And so you want to say, critique somebody for giving a, a light and simple message. <laughs> Tell the Apostle John, because this is one hobby horse he does not let go of. And now, day or later, I give you a new, uh, not a new command, but one that you've had from the beginning. I ask you to love one another. And this is love, that we walk, there's the walk again, in obedience to his commands. And you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. Now, the word in love is not in the Greek. Why is it in our English translations? Not all English translations, but most English translations. The reason is because it is implied. It is implied, and what you do when you're translating, you can see the weight comes from what was said previously. Let me give you an example of how this works. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. I quote this verse a lot, and I never can remember if it's 18 or 19. And even when I look it up, I still can't remember, you know, two minutes later. But it says this, Do not be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. Then Paul gives five participles. 
Participle is an ing ending word. Uh, uh, thanking, praising, singing. The last participle he gives is submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The very next verse says, wives, submit to your husbands. The word submit is not in that verse. But almost every translation puts, wives, submit to your husbands. But it's correct translation because it comes from the previous sentence. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives to your husbands. But then it flows out, husbands love your wife. And so the two are both expressions of submission, both from that one verse that says, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. My only point in saying that it is standard translation and use of language to get the weight from what was said previously. So in this case, what does it primarily mean when he says, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands, the weight of it is walk in love. Walk in love. And I want to point that out because we, as Christians, will often get very hung up on trying to obey what we feel, let's say, is every command that you have in your head, every list of possible things. For example, let's just say for argument's sake, for those who are uh, in this room here, that you decided to stay home. A few of you might feel guilty. I mean, I could have gone, but I didn't. And then for you watching online, some of you, if you decided not to watch online, you're going to watch something on TV instead. But while you're watching your show, you're feeling guilty. But you tell yourself, I'll just watch the class later, you know, after my show is over. And then later becomes several weeks, and you don't even remember what class that was. And then you feel more guilt. My point is, we Christians are so good at feeling guilty. But John wants you to hit on the majors here. And what is the major? Have you got the love thing down? Do you know what it means to love someone? Darlene, do you know what it means to love someone? Even if it means wearing a face mask. You see, this is, she's doing all these kind of mean gestures to me right now. <laughs> I'm going to turn the camera so you know. <laughs> the truth is, we, loving is the heart of the gospel. And so it, it should impact what we're doing. Okay, but now comes the problem that we're dealing with here. Um, let me just move on a little bit here. Okay. Actually, I'm going to leave that scripture up there. Here's the problem. Verse 7. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world have gone out into the world any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist now here comes the heart of the issue remember when uh, pastor nathan taught his class and he talked about the proto gnostic and uh, sometimes when you get this stuff it's kind of hard to like understand what's being said but gnosticism was a belief that when jesus came he did not come in physical body he was spiritually present and why they argued this is because the body they viewed as bad so jesus is good he couldn't have a body and so he must have been here only as a spirit but john sat under jesus he ate dinner with him he watched Jesus sleep. He knew he came in the flesh. And so he wants to hit this false teaching directly. Now, one of the things, um, the, 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 our friends in the back who said, I have a question pertaining to a previous class, um, their question was a good one. I referred to a few weeks back of the kenosis passage this is philippians chapter 2 in which we read that jesus emptied himself 
And when I was preparing for my dissertation, Pastor Nathan gave me some help. And he says, the right language to say is Jesus uh, chose to uh, put on a shelf his divine prerogatives. In other words, although being fully God, he didn't use his divine attributes. He never gave up his being God, but he functioned like a human being. Why is that important theologically? And this is the verses I have on the stage here, uh, on the screen here. John, but he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, this is Thomas, and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Later on, when Jesus appears, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Here's Hebrews. So Priscilla is saying, I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> for those, uh, for, excuse me, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. It is so theologically important to see Jesus as fully human. It's so he's our advocate. Uh, Job says, if there was only somebody, a mediator, who would put his hand on, on both of our heads and to bring us into union, but as for me, there is not. To which Paul says in Timothy, there is now one mediator between uh, God and man, the man Christ Jesus. It is so crucial that we understand the humanity of Jesus Christ. And so that's why John hits this very heavily. Um, it's very, very important to him. And so how important is it? Look at verse 7 end. Any such person is, here's the article, the deceiver and the antichrist, which is, he's not talking about the antichrist in terms of the end times. He is talking about an arch deceiver. In other words, we're not talking somebody who has... A uh, little variance in belief, but can't we all just get along? No, it's crossing a line. It's crossing a line where we cannot say that this is appropriate. So he uses this very strong language which conveys how serious this is for him. So, verse 8 is no surprise. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for. We could mean all of us together or in probability, what John is in starting this church. You don't want him to give up the faith. You don't want him to start getting caught up in things that they just should not be caught up in. And, and his work is not working for salvation. It is working to give you the good news, the, the gospel, his teaching, building this church, starting this church. But instead that you may be fully rewarded. He wants to see this church cross the finish line and, and you know, run well uh, as to what it could be. Uh, a few weeks ago when I preached, I told the story about Pastor Klo and starting this church in 1943. And, you know, it was just a handful of people meeting in the underdog house. But if Pastor Klo, uh, he may have been alive, I don't know, but in 1975, when, he, when this church had 12 people, and he said, I planted this church. I, he probably wouldn't be real thrilled to see it has less people than when he started it. And probably a little depressing. But when we brought David Seifert here, um, who was the pastor who came in 1975 and grew the church to 70 people, when he came here in 2004 and saw a vibrant, thriving church, he was thrilled. He was happy to come. Because he saw, you know, what, what he planted was still growing and doing something well. In the same sense, that's what he's talking about here. I want to see you guys cross the finish line and, and be rewarded. Verse 9, if anyone, excuse me, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Now, this idea of running ahead, we think, 
was what this schismatic group did. You guys are behind. Do you ever hear this phrase in the media? You're on the wrong side of history. You Christians who are so rigid about abortion, you, you Christians who are so rigid about gay marriage, you're on the wrong side of history. Everything is moving in our direction. That's very compelling for people because they're thinking, wow, I don't wanna be left behind. That's what everyone's thinking these days. Well, apparently that was a similar phrase of these schismatics. We have moved on. We've discovered these truths. You haven't? Well, here's John who started the church saying, if you're hearing people talk that way, smell, something's funky, stay away, run away, keep away. Because if you know, you follow that group, you don't have God. On the other hand, you continue in the teaching you had from the beginning, you have the Father and the Son. It's kind of cool, by the way. If you could go back in time to the year 1500, or the year 1300, the year 1200, you could plug into a church, and if you could speak their language, you could worship with them, because they got the same Bible. They actually, now, because of the, you know, the dissemination of the Word of God wasn't as strong then, you still had the, all the roots were there. There really is nothing new when it comes to the faith. And it, it's very dangerous to think that there is. All right, moving on here. Verse 10. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. Now let's just pretend we're in China, and we do not have one of the official churches. We have a house church. The weight of scholarship is do not let them into your house is a house church. Dear lady, your children, into your house, probably into your church. That's probably. In other words, if you have a pagan friend who needs a place to stay overnight, and you give them shelter, you say you can stay in this rest, you know, bedroom. Most think that John is saying, don't be hospitable to somebody who believes different than you. But he is saying they shouldn't be preaching. They shouldn't be on that stage. And so, you know, whenever, you know, in my tenure as senior pastor, and I'm sure Henry's going to be the same way, anyone who has access to the stage has had a conversation with an elder, with the senior pastor, with somebody to verify, is this person with the truth? Do they have their ducks in a row? And if they don't, you say, you know, nice to meet you. You, you can't speak. You, you, you know, you just have to have your, your boundary up. That being said, by the way, when you're assessing somebody, it doesn't mean they have to agree with every stinking thing that you believe in. Um, I've had people here preach that are more Pentecostal than I am. I've had people preach who are less Pentecostal than I am. I've had people who, you know, have little variances on their belief that we can agree to disagree on, but I knew the orthodox teaching of the faith was going to be solid. No issues. That is what John is saying here, is that don't let them into your house. Don't let them into your church if that's the, the situation. Otherwise, anyone who does this, verse 11, and welcomes them, shares in their wicked work. Now, that's a frightening statement. So if you allow some heretic to, to preach in your community or in your Bible study, and by the way, you can have a small group, and let's say you show a video from YouTube from somebody who's a little hinky. Be careful. That would be an example, again, of watch what you're doing in terms of what you're inviting. So verse 12, here, here's the one that was the frustration. I have so much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. Now, that phrase, I do not want to use paper and ink, is actually found in a number of ancient letters. In other words, it's kind of the phrase you ended your letter with. We do that in our own letters, too. We, we say things very similar to this. Um, but that was a, just a common phrase. And so in the beginning, or I should say verse 4, what is making him joyful? 
that there are people following the truth. Here, what he says is going to make our joy complete is we get to see you. You know, we get to be with you, and, and that is going to be, be wonderful. I told you this week I went hunting around uh, in this box of old letters. When Michelle and I were dating, she lived in Nevada, and I lived in New York. So she came out to visit, and she was afraid that I would forget her, you know, because there's a lot of girls out here, and she's 2,000 miles away. And so she hid 30-something notes in my textbooks, in my room, in anywhere, in my kitchen, everywhere I would like, take something out, and there would be another note from Michelle. It could be as simple as thinking of you, uh, wow, you, you're so handsome. Anyway, they were, they were nice. And you're right, she was right. I didn't forget her every time I pull one of these notes. But as much as they gave me a warm feeling reading them, how much more did I want to be with her? Because even though I was going to, you know, back in the day when you had to wait till 11 o'clock to talk cheaply on the phone, do you remember those days? <laughs> you know, and, you know, when I spent, get this, back in 1984, $300 a month on my phone, long distance charges, because of a long distance girlfriend. You know, we wanted to talk like every night, and it was, and it was these were the discount prices. You know, I am very grateful for our current generation where we have a much cheaper phone service. But John is just saying, when we're together, it's going to be so much better, so much better. And finally, he says this, You're the children of your sister who is chosen by God send their greetings. Who do you think the sister is? His church. Yeah. Another church. So I often call Centerpoint Church our sister church because we're good friends with them. I mean, I've been friends with Brian for years. Pastor Henry came from Centerpoint Church. They're a sister church. There are a number of Bethlehem Assemblies of God. I'm good friends with Steve Malazzo. I call them a sister church. And so I love having these sister churches. And by the way, you know how we name ships? You know, we call them a her in the ancient world, you also use the feminine when you're describing an entity. Um, and so it was the same thing with churches. So, and this, by the way, is one of the reasons why we don't think that this is a formal name of uh, children of your sister chosen by God, meaning electa, because if her name is electa, her sister is electa. It's like the parents are very non-creative because they name both girls Electa. So that is a good argument that this is a church and not a person. So, uh, children of your sister who are chosen by God, send their greetings. Thus ends the little short letter of 2 John. And with that, we'll close in prayer. And next week, we wrap up with 3 John and that will end our cool summer night study. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to study your word. Thank you for the privilege of studying 2 John and allowing the elder John to teach us. And what he has reminded us of is love and walking in love. And what has he reminded us of? Staying in the truth, hanging out with people who follow the truth. And what is the truth? to have a view of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, that he came in the flesh, lived among us, and is now our advocate before our God the Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.